Hello everyone, this is Shannon from Not So Poe, and today I am joined by Cynthia at Book Whimsy. Uh, Cynthia is one of my very close booktube friends, and she has an amazing channel. She reads everything, but especially lots of romance, lots of nonfiction that is about history, and just classics and all sorts of literature. So I definitely recommend you check out her channel if you're not already subscribed. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about a book that we just read together called Signs Preceding the End of the World by Yuri Herrera, translated from Spanish by Lisa Dillman. And we loved it. It was so, so good. So, um, so what we're going to do today is just talk about some of the things that we thought made this book really stand out and kind of, I don't know, grip us. It was super short, only like a hundred pages long, and we were so enthralled while reading it. So we just wanted to talk about all of the great ways that this book did so many things um, that made us fall in love with it in those short, short pages. Um, and we're not going to be talking about spoilers, but this is just kind of overall our feelings about the book. Okay, so the first thing that we wanted to talk about that was so great about this book was the way that it felt like a quest story. And it felt almost surreal in the journey, even though this is firmly in sort of contemporary literary fiction. It's not at all um, SFF. And I wouldn't even really say that it's magical realism, but it just has this feel of a mythical quest. Um, in the story, we follow Makina, who lives uh, basically in Mexico, and she has to travel across the border to find her brother um, because he's been gone for a long time and her mom wants him to come back. And Makina has to go through this series of mini quests, side quests, to accomplish things for different people so that she can achieve her bigger quest of finding her brother. And each time she interacts with people and goes goes through these things, there's this feeling of it being almost magical despite it being firmly rooted in reality. And I just thought that was such a cool feeling to the book. One of the themes that stood out to me as part of her quest is that although men play a key role in that quest, that women actually stood out the most to me because the female characters in the story are incredibly capable, starting with Makina, who just has a strong sense of who she is, has a strong sense of purpose. She's on a journey. She knows the steps to take and she knows what she's supposed to be doing. Even when she doesn't quite know exactly what's going on, she still has a strong sense of purpose and of identity and, and that is great for those of us who, who like, you know, capable, competent women. Um, they Women also appear at key moments in the story and really are the ones who propel the story forward in a lot of ways. Whenever Makina feels a little bit lost or doesn't know what to do next, women pop up in the story and really move the story forward, starting with her mom, who initiates this quest and then a uh, woman she meets uh, in the U.N. what is the U.S. it's never explicitly said but it's it's supposed to be the U.S. Um, and then uh, Makina herself so if you're into strong capable women this book has quite uh, quite strong women. And I think that what's really cool too about their strength is that all of them are sort of no nonsense like their strength is just in that they're very practical. They're going to get things done. They're not going to make excuses. They're also not going to take any crap from anybody. Um, but they're very um, also compassionate towards other people. So it's not that they're some sort of hard people who don't care. They're people who care. They look out for others, um, but they're also going to get done what needs to get done. And I just really like that kind of strength. The next thing that really stood out to me, I think, is the language that is used in this book, both the way that the writing itself is, as well as the way that the book talks about language. So it's it's very much meta as well as um, the language used. And the translator's note at the end is really cool, too, talking about how she thought about how to translate this, because it is a very unique narrative style. It, has this, again, mythical feel to the way that it's written. Something about it feels almost fairy tale like. Um, and it's, it's very gripping and very immersive. Uh, I have a quote just to give an example. Mr. H smiled, 
sinister with all the artlessness of a snake disguised as a man coiling around your legs. And it's just like this great use of language. There's so many interesting word choices. Um, you feel both close to Machina as well as having that almost detached third person narrator that is common in a fairy tale or a myth. So all of that in terms of the way that the language is used in the book is wonderful. And then the way that the book talks about language is absolutely amazing. I loved it because Machina is somebody who speaks um, you know, it doesn't really say, but she speaks multiple languages and she's constantly being uh, somebody who is translating and who's thinking about the way that language is used. And as she crosses the border, she has a lot of observations on the way that people use different language um, and just some of the observations on how um, kind of people switch between the languages or how they mix the languages or how they use a language that isn't their original language. It's all such a fascinating discussion about the power of language to express identity and thought and emotion. And I really, really liked it. Yeah, and I'll just add that the translator actually won an award for her work on this book and, and clearly did a lot of work. There's a translator's note at the end that was absolutely fascinating and made me realize that I need to reread this book and actually I need to reread it both in English and in Spanish. <laughs> so another theme that keeps popping up in the story after Machina crosses the border is that of Anglos. This is one of the instances in which it becomes clear what border and what countries are, are being discussed in the story because when once she crosses the border, there's a different population of people, Anglos, and that is stated in, in that phrasing. And as she encounters more and more Anglos, it is clear that Anglos don't quite understand their place in the world and how they interact with migrants. And Makina, because she has such a strong sense of herself, is able to see these people clearly. And because she's also not necessarily planning on staying in this place, she's here and it is, has crossed the border for a quick journey, she hopes, at the beginning. And so she, she, she just, she sees these people and sees the, the oddness of their culture and the oddness of their behavior. Uh, just a quick example, when she first crosses the border, she goes uh, to what is a grocery store and sees people at the self-checkout. And she notices how um, everybody's there kind of behaving almost in a robotic manner, but also that people as they're self uh, at the self-checkout, that they jump every time the self-checkout beeps. And it's something that I know I've done at the self-checkout. Uh, like just the odd experience of, of doing a self-checkout. But when when you're part of this, when, when it feels normal to you, you don't notice the little odd behaviors that you do at these places. And she, because she's a bit of an outsider, uh, is able to pick up on that and, and reflect on it. And the way Herrera brings it into the story just makes you want to take note of all these little instances of, of how uh, insights into Anglo identity and also migrant identity and how those identity, how those th those themes interact. Um, in fact, I started tabbing up my book because I read the physical book and um, I was starting to run out of tabs and decided I couldn't tab every page. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. But these little instances of just really clearly seeing American culture and it's odd. And kind of related to that idea of Machina serving as someone who can observe what's going on with the Anglos, she serves as sort of a bridge between worlds. She serves as a bridge between this US community that she's gone to to find her brother, as well as her home community, which we assume is in Mexico, even though it's not explicitly stated. Um, she has a job as kind of like a switchboard operator and as a translator, and she's somebody who can understand sort of both sides and act as that bridge. Um, it's referred to like in one line as a hinge, um, somebody who can kind of connect those two worlds and um, 
be somebody who can relate to both sides and help those sides relate to each other as well. So I thought that that was just such an interesting discussion, especially because so much of this story is focusing on migration and focusing on people going back and forth over the border and her being this almost, again, like a mythical person who can connect those two and move past the, the borders and the barriers. Absolutely. And then related to that is the theme of identity. And uh, that's something we, we both brought up that one, Makina has a strong sense of self, but, but from the very beginning, she knows that this journey is going to change her. She's very aware of that because she has seen people who return from, uh, from the U.S. come back and they're not the same. And their family has changed and everything is just different. She has seen that. And so she knows and she explicitly says, the more time people spend over there, the more they change, the more things are different. And so the border and that crossing, the whole journey changes you. And she she thinks she's going to be able to do this quickly and come back with minimal change. Um, but um, as she crosses the border and spends more time in the U.S., it is clear that there is something changing. There is something changing for her. Um, food also comes up as a one of these uh, elements where identity is, is inscribed in food. And because uh, where she sat at, in the Anglo side in the U.S., is it's a border area. There's this mixture of identity where there might be other ethnic foods or, or American foods, but who's cooking it? Who's uh, behind the scenes in the kitchen? Oh, well, it's those migrants. And so they're really the ones who are making the food. So it's a kind of still Mexican food uh, there. Um, she also, or the theme of identity also comes up with her brother, who has a different relationship with identity and belonging. And we get to see how that changes him and how Makina reacts to those changes and to the new brother that uh, that that she meets uh, in the U.S. Um, I also want, want to note that a lot of the things will feel really familiar to those of us who, who, who have our immigrants or are close to the immigrant experience uh, from the moment of leaving uh, the original place, the crossing to the arriving in a whole new place and creating something new. Uh, there's a phrase that kept popping up uh, in my head as I was reading it in Spanish that is really popular among, among migrant communities is ni de aquí ni de allá, not from here and not from there. And that is very present whenever the topic of identity pops up in the story. And it's, I think that that theme of, of identity and neither here nor there is kind of threaded throughout almost everything else that we've talked about too. Um, things like the discussion of language, the discussion of the kind of patois that happens when you mix languages and how it's neither English nor Spanish, but it's some third new thing as well that has its own meaning and its own identity. And I feel like all of that is just threaded throughout the whole story in a really fascinating way. So identity was such a great theme in this. Yeah, and it really connected like everything for me, including my own personal experiences. Like I just kept, things kept popping up, even though my experience, my coming to the US was different than, than what's being described in the story. It just, it felt like just really personal and yet also like this element of separation because of that like, almost magical, like almost like sci fantasy element that the story has. Okay, so those are some of the things that we really noticed about this story that stood out to us, some of the themes, some of the aspects of it. It was such a great read. Um, I'm definitely a huge fan of this and would recommend it. And I loved also just sharing this experience with Cynthia. Yeah, and thank you, Shannon, because you um, created a video about Buddy Reads, and this book was on your list. And the minute I saw it, I knew I, I wanted to read it because it was on my TBR and that reading it with you would be awesome. It's also really short for anybody that uh, is interested. Um, it's totally worth your time. 
And I also think that for anybody who is um, a fan of SFF but doesn't read a lot of literary fiction, I think that because of a lot of the way that this is approached and the themes and the just this magical quest feel of it, this could be a very good gateway into reading more literary fiction or more translated fiction. So it's definitely something that I, I would really recommend for anybody. Okay, so if you guys have read this book or if you have any thoughts, if you have any questions or any recommendations, anything at all, go ahead and leave us a comment down below and thanks for joining us.